We are meeting Dag Svarnes in Aarhus in Denmark. Dag is a professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology uh, in Trondheim. Since the late 1980s, Dag has been teaching and doing research in human-computer interaction. And uh, one of his main areas of interest is the philosophy of interaction. And in this interview, Dag will provide us with some of his, his main guidelines, which embody his approach to understanding interactivity. So, Dag, um, what are your most important guidelines for interaction designers? First of all, it's a lot of it is common sense, and a lot of it is actually already in the methodology that has in, evolved in aspects best practice in interaction design, doing field studies, doing interviews, understanding the user, mm -hmm. and understanding that users are different and understanding what Heidegger and Husserl call the life worlds of the user, the, the, the way the, you, the, the world that the user lives in. So when you want to design this thermostat you have to identify the user, say if, if we're designing for kids we have to understand the kids but not only understand the kids but understand the, the world that the kids live in and what is this world that is natural for these kids. So, so that would be the starting point for mm -hmm. Heidegger. And then of course to understand, then he would, you could do some kind of a, a tool analysis, uh, which is part of or Heidegger's analysis of, of, of objects, saying uh, how do we make this object as interaction as natu natural as possible. How do we make it into a tool, something that you just use yeah. without have to, having to reflect on it? So you have to make it as, as intuitive as possible. Right? Mm -hmm. so that, Could you explain that uh, uh, for the iPhone, for example? The intuitive approach always has to be related to what this person, what is natural for this person. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you made, if you made an, a mobile phone or if, if you made a switch for someone 300 years ago, you, you would have to explain everything. Mm -hmm. yeah, you really have to sort of explain things. But, but for us, switches are natural things. We, we, we are grown up with switches. Yeah. We, we don't remember when we, when we first touched the switch, when we turned on, on the light for the first time. We did it as three years old or two yeah. years old at some point, but, but we've forgotten already. Mm -hmm. It's part of our what we do, yeah. part of our, what we as eating and drinking and everything else. So when we design digital artifacts these days, we can start with what people already know, what people already can, mm -hmm. the skills that and expectations that people already have. So. I expect that when I press a button, something happens, mm -hmm. and when I when then I, when I move something, something happens. When I press something, something happens. Yeah. So so you already deal with users who have this basic idea of pressing buttons mm -hmm. and moving things to make things happen. But if you design for people from a different planet or whatever, then then they might have different ways of doing things. Yeah, of course. And it would need more explanation. Yeah. So, so it, it's a lot about simply knowing the user and knowing what what skills the user have and what expectations the user have mm -hmm. and to make things that behave the way they expect. Okay. And a lot of this is common sense. I mean, a lot of it, it, it's not that Heidegger. I mean, if you sort of, if you cloned Heidegger or if you sort of, uh, if Heidegger... Uh, so what would Heidegger do as an interaction designer? I mean, he wouldn't know where to begin. No. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's, uh, and Heidegger was actually against much of this uh, modern technology. Yeah. He didn't like it. He was longing for the, for, for, for the deep forests. Yeah. Sort of, and, and the old style way of living. So he was a romantic in a way. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, I mean, so, so so it doesn't really make sense to say what's, what is the Heidegger approach to, 
No, but for you, what is the major take-home point of Heidegger's theory? Some of the major thing. One one thing is that there is this very practical thing, the idea of breakdown, which we use, which is borrowed from Heidegger. The idea that you should make interactions that flow, that don't require you to think. Mm-hmm. And Heidegger has this idea that when we use something, when something behaves as a tool, as a zoic, uh, then it it is transparent in use, meaning that when I touch the switch, I'm not necessarily conscious that I touch the switch, I just turn on and turn off the light. And as long as it works as a switch, it is transparent in use. And this is sort of the ideal technology is transparent in use, mm-hmm. so the ideal user interface, an ideal to, to strive for, and this is the user, fa- user interfaces that are transparent yeah. in the sense that you don't have to deal with the user interface as such. Mm-hmm. But yeah. often you have to. Often you have to. And, and, and then in some cases you, you have to because you, you simply, something happens, like your hard disk is full or something like that. But then it's important to have, um, to be able to design the system in such a way that you, you're, you're told how to, what to do, what are the strategies to deal with this mm-hmm. breakdown. So instead of sort of getting error 404, you get something, some meaningful hints of how to deal with it, yeah. how to repair, repair this situation. Mm-hmm. But ideally, the computer or, or, or any electronic artifact should, digital artifact should be a tool, should be something that enables you to do whatever you want to do. I mean, it might come to as a surprise to a lot of computer people, but computer science or programmers, but most people couldn't care less yeah. about the, of the working of the computer. Mm-hmm. It's just boring. It just doesn't interest them. But they still love computers. But they don't love computers because they love the internals of the computer or they love Java programming or anything like that. They love computers because it enables them to do stuff. Yeah. But the stuff they do has nothing to do with computers. It's about com- communicating with friends, making videos, uh, watching other people's videos, etc., etc., etc. So a good computer is a tool, something that enables you to do something, and it's important to always ha- always have this in mind. And it's only the, the nerdy people like yeah. me who sort of feel that oh, how cool! How did they really make this work? So, <laughs> so oh, really? So why is the green pixel up there using ah, oh, really cool? I mean, so, so we're interested in the in sort of the yeah. nitty gritty of the thing itself, mm-hmm. but the thing itself doesn't really interest most users, and and it shouldn't, and they shouldn't need to to deal with it. Mm-hmm. So, so, so that's the, 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 the tool perspective of Heidegger, yeah. which has been very important. And it's it's common sense. I mean, it's, 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 um, you don't need to read sort of thousand pages of German philosophy to understand that. But still, it's, easy, it, it's important to be reminded of this because it, it's easy when you come from a computer science background like me to be sort of so fascinated with the possibilities of the technology mm-hmm. that you spend a lot of energy on building in all kind of features and, 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 and new cool ways of doing things and buttons there and buttons there and forget about the user. So just the idea of building something not for yourself but for something else mm-hmm is to many people from a computer science background quite uh, a change of perspective. Yeah. And and this and Heidegger is then one way of sort of introducing this. Mm-hmm. This idea that that the that we are as users, we are we are not sort of primarily thinking and planning. We are in the environment mm-hmm. and we act. That's the primary thing, yeah, and, and that's the, the whole Heidegger idea, and that we are, the, which is the break that Heidegger did back in the late nineteen twenties, with with the the, tra- the the philosophical tradition going back to Plato, so the break that we are not sort of primarily cognitive thinking, reflecting people, individuals, mm-hmm. beings. We are in the world, yeah. That's the primary thing. And then we should start with the way we are in the world. Mm-hmm. And then he starts his analysis of um, how we are in the world as a starting point for understanding what it means to be human. So Heidegger he sort of gives us this frame of reference 
this it it keeps in mind the contextual nature of work and use that it's always contextual mm -hmm. and it's always personal and you should always make sure that you that you have feedback from the users that you you sort of you really have a deep understanding of who these users are and what they're going to use it for mm -hmm. and but not only sort of get a deep understanding and and then go back and design and hope that it gets right because all experience over the last 20 years in interaction design tell us that you have to iterate you have to come up with sketches you have to show the users what you think would be a good idea and you have to expose them to quite concrete examples of what you want to make and then you have to listen carefully to what they say and from that you both learn more about what you built but you also learn more about the user and you learn more about the use situation and a lot of this is common sense but it wasn't necessarily common sense 20 years ago and most a lot of it has come as a result of best practice designers have evolved these techniques but it hasn't always been put in a, in a frame or in a philosophical or theoretical frame for understanding how all these techniques fit together so if for example i have a if i have a, an alternative of different techniques say should i use uh, cultural probes like Gil, bill gaver uh, um, suggests then okay so why should i use cultural probes and for what purpose what do i want to get out of it what kind of insights do i want to get out of it so i have to be quite sort of specific about what what do i want to learn from the user and and, and how uh, and, and when, how does this fit into the overall the overall plan that i have for this process so it then you have to sort of remind yourself that okay so it's not just cultural probes for the purpose of coming up with some nice pictures from people's lives i have to have a plan i have to have some idea about what i'm going to use this for and how i going to how that is going to feed the next step in the process how that is going to how that is going to inform me about the users and the use situation and their how they perceive this technology so heidegger is more a kind of a general framework that makes this show me shows me how these things fit together mm -hmm. that's that's my my take on it yeah. i mean other people have different <coughs> takes. So, so it's more this is my inspiration this is what i how i use it Okay, so if you take some of the current trends in mm. HCI, mm. would it be possible for any of these trends to learn more things from, from Heidegger? Yeah. One of the interesting things that has already happened over the last five years is that we, a lot of interaction design products are no longer only about designing one single gadget, but it's more about service design designing the totality of a service like you design an iPhone and you design the App Store so it's the combination of the iPhone and the App Store and you have uh, an iPod which is the physical iPod it's the software in the iPod it's the connection to the iTunes the software on your PC and it's the connection from the iTunes to the to the iTunes store and the connection there to the music industry so you you design the whole service all the way from your earplugs to uh, the recording studios so you, you do take responsibility for the whole service which is service design and like when Amazon sell Kindles they don't sell Kindles because they want to be in the computer industry, computer business they sell kindles because they want to sell books so the kindle is there as a medium for selling books and the service they sell is reading and buying books mm -hmm. buying material so so they design and take responsibility for the for the whole service and often then you not only have the service but you also have different gadgets that fit together 
So we sell this combination of gadgets that fit together, whether it's a, an iPhone and the computer and the way they communicate, etc. And, and this fits nicely with Heidegger, because when Heidegger talked about equipment, he, he, he in some cases you can talk about a pen, but in most cases a pen is part of an ecology of things. So a tool is always part, in, in most cases, it's part of an ecology of things. So I have a pen and I also have paper. And with post-it notes, I even have post-it notes that I can place on paper and I can write on paper. And often it's about designing for these, this ecology of things. Mm -hmm. And you can also imagine that you could design combinations of new post-it notes and pens that fit together in some way. So to see this totality of this ecology of things and ecology of services. And we find it also when we look at the ecology of services, how do, how do you integrate Facebook with the Twitter, with your different accounts, with your email, mm -hmm. etc., and to make all this fit together. And from a Heidegger perspective, he talks about what he calls the equipmental whole, that's kind of Heidegger language, that, that these things always fit together and they refer to each other mm. and they get their meaning from each other. So the pen gets its meaning as a pen from the paper and the paper gets its meaning as paper from the fact that it is being written on by a pen. So it's the fact that we have pens make paper into what paper is. So you have this sort of the way they refer to each other and and give it each other meaning. And when you design ecologies of things and ecologies of products, you always have to relate to this existing ecology of services and objects. And if you design a combine, if you design a package of some kind, you always have to design, keep in mind how these different elements in the package refer to each other. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not just about creating one thing, but it's creating a service, a combination of things, and to make it fit into an existing world of mm -hmm. things and services. And this equipment, equipmental, this nexus of things that uh, Heidegger talks about. Uh, which to me is sort of it makes sense and the way things refer to each other and give each other meaning in some kind of a dialogue between the different things so they they sort of uh, amplify each other mm -hmm. in a way yeah. so that's one way of using Heidegger for some of the challenges I see ahead for the next two or three or five years so you brought this uh, these yeah. very weird items. Yeah, uh, today I brought a couple of pants. Yeah. Um, it has to do with what a thing is. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing that is important when you design is to keep in mind that things are often used in different ways than what you planned. Mm -hmm. So you might have some idea about what this should be used for. For example, you design a pen, and you know a pen can be used for writing. Mm -hmm. A red pen, a green pen. But pens can also be used for a lot of other different purposes. You can use it for as chopsticks. So if you're hungry, you can use pens as chopsticks. You can use them to scratch your back, or you can play theater. Hello, hello. Nice <laughs> to meet you. Oh, okay. Bye bye. <laughs> so, what a thing is depends on the use. Yeah. And it depends on the context of use. And people will always come up come up with different ways of using your product, mm -hmm. and in ways that you couldn't even imagine. So, so it's it's difficult to imagine what you cannot imagine. Yeah. But at least it's important to have that, keep that in mind mm -hmm. when you design something, that even if I have this, I think that this product will be used 
the purpose of this product is that it should be used like this and this and this. People would use it for different purposes in different contexts mm -hmm. than what you planned. And that's important to have in, keep in mind when you design. And it's very important to keep in mind when you, mind when you redesign. Yeah. Because in the next version of your product, you should really base your design decisions on how this product is used. Mm -hmm. And not only on how you think it should be used. Or you might, and then you might even end up with a lot of other uh, spin-off products mm -hmm. based on what you observe of how this product is used. So what something is, and, and, and so, so to go back to the philosophy of things, so an object like this. For Heidegger, he would if you if you do the extreme philosophical perspective on this, then Heidegger would say that what you we have here are atoms. It is matter. It is something. It definitely exists. Mm -hmm. But what it is depends on the use. And it depends on the way we describe it. The way we use it. The way we talk about it. The meaning that it gets in the social context. So we think of it as a pen. Because it is designed for writing. For drawing. So we, we sell it as a pen mm -hmm. and we sort of give it away. Hey, do you want a pen? I need a pen. But, we, but what it really is, is neither a pen, nor chopsticks, nor for scratching your back, nor for playing in theater. It, what it is, is just matter in space. Mm -hmm. And what it becomes is, depends on what we use it for. If, for example, this pen was used for signing a peace treaty in the Middle East, then it would end up in a museum. And it would be a significant, significant, its significance would come from the fact that it was used at this, at this date for writing some signatures on a piece of paper. So the meaning of an object is both socially constructed and it is constructed in the context, in the way, by the way it is used. So nothing really exists. It's just matter and space. Thank you so much, Dark, for passing on your guidelines. And if you want to know more, you should have a look at our other videos with Dark, and you can also read his chapter at interactiondesign.org. Here you can also find more videos like this one and you can find chapters written by thought leaders and inventors. Thanks for watching.